So we are still working through the step potential, same procedure. Now what will be different is instead of considering case where energy is greater than the potential, we'll be looking at where maybe my energy is now less than the potential. Um, otherwise, the, much of it remains the same. So I'm still going to start out with, well, my wave function is going to be divided into two regions. Um, I'm going to find my general solution. I'll find my general solution. And then um, I will reduce the number of free parameters by applying the boundary condition. And it's still going to be the same boundary condition. So, um, so I guess that means in region one, nothing changes. Right? It's the same differential equation, same general solution. So uh, I guess I should write down again what the uh, definition of K1 was. So the left-hand side, nothing changes. K1 is still square root of 2m e over h bar. And as far as the general solution goes, this is still the form. And like before, I'm still going to say later a is equal to 1 to look at reflectivity and just the reflectivity. <laughs> Transmittivity is a little too hard now. Um, all right, so that's fine. Um, now, it's in the region two where things change a little bit. So let me make changes as we go. Uh, what's the sign of E minus V naught for this condition here? Now it's a negative. So the form of this is a little bit deceptive because this coefficient as a whole is actually positive now. So let me rewrite it so that um, I don't have this mistaken perception that this is, I'm somehow dealing with negative coefficient. I'm dealing with now positive coefficient. So if this coefficient is positive, would I still have a harmonic oscillator solutions? No, right? Sines and cosines, when you take two derivatives, you get negative coefficient. Complex exponentials, when you take two derivatives, i squared is minus one, or minus i squared is also minus one. So these solutions no longer work. I have to come up with a, a solution that will now work. So um, what kind of solution, just taking a guess, would fit to uh, be a solution to this differential equation? Exponential, right? Real exponential, not complex exponential. So that's what it's going to be. Um, normally, people use kappa for, uh, yeah, I think I can keep using kappa. Um, so instead of the complex exponential I had before, it's going to be real exponential. C times e to the, oh, sorry, almost wrote i, kappa to. Sorry, my kappas and k's often look the same. So I'm going to call it kappa, but if it looks like a k, my apologies. Uh, but one and two distinguish them, so I think it's not going to be too confusing. Um, so this is one solution. There's another linearly independent solution. That's this one. Um, e to the minus kappa 2x. Because when you take two derivatives, it doesn't matter if this was minus or plus. So, so this is my new solution in the um, my new solution in the region two beyond the, the step. And um, all right, so those are my oh I guess I should write down my definition of kappa. So kappa two is defined as square root of two m v naught minus e over h bar. And just to make sure we didn't make any mistake, is uh, my kappa to real and positive? As in, the thing that I'm putting under the square root, it's positive. Right? Good. All right. So, OK. So I have two general solutions. Um, one, two, three, four, three parameters. I'm going to get rid of one of them, a, by setting it equal to 1. All right. I still have three. Um, so I can write down two equations by applying boundary conditions like last time. So let's, uh, let's just start out with that. So my first equation is the continuity of this wave function. So 
it'll, it's going to be so a times one plus b times one again is equal to um, c times one still yeah okay it's still one c plus d let me replace a with one because that's what we are going to do in the end anyway um, all right i guess that's good continuity of the first two derivative the the wave function must be smooth so um, imagine taking the derivative here i get factor of ik minus ik one um, so it's the same thing we did last time so setting a equal to one i get i k one minus i k one b is equal to now this time i just get kappa two and minus kappa two no i's so i have kappa two c minus kappa two kappa kappa two d all right two equations three unknowns I need to reduce this down to only two unknowns. So you know which uh, coefficient I'm going to try to get rid of, right? Any ideas? Which one do you think I'll try to get rid of? D? I um, think the way I wrote it, it's actually not D. So here's the thing. When we had a complex exponential solution, there was a very clear physical meaning to them, that it's a traveling wave with some particular momentum. When you have a real exponential solution, can you still say that? No, no. no, it's no longer a momentum eigenstate. So I need to, I'm going to get rid of one of these two. I just need to come up with a different excuse for getting rid of it. Why C? Because it's not going to increase. Yeah. So when you look at C, so you know, these wave functions, they start at the barrier x equals 0. That's where they start. When you look at the term that goes with the C, it looks like an exponential increase. When you look at the term going with a d, it looks like an exponential decrease. So whichever wave function it is, you don't want it to blow up to infinity, because you cannot normalize something that blows up to infinity. So this is behaving OK. It's a de exponentially decaying. Um, this is not. <laughs> so the only way to make sure my overall solution comes out right is by saying, all right, for whatever reason, this is c is going to be 0. Um, I guess the normalizing the wave function makes a C0. Yeah. So yeah, so I get rid of C. So this is the only term remaining. Now I have uh, something I can solve for. So uh, let me just to solve for B, since we are, don't have that much time. And um, I guess uh, even if we were to find the coefficient D, oh, wait, yeah, yeah, even if we were to find the coefficient d, I'm not entirely sure what meaning I can assign to coefficient d. So, um, so let me just solve for b, because uh, b can still work as reflectivity. Or um, I guess the technical names are, when I get b, the name for this is the reflection coefficient. And when I calculate b, absolute value squared, this will be reflectance. And I've been, I was trying to look up the difference between reflectance and reflectivity. Uh, you can correct me if, uh, you know, look it up on your own and correct me, send me a message if I'm wrong. I think it's the same thing. But I think both means the same thing. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I'm looking at how much intensity gets reflected. So, all right, let's, uh, um, let's solve for, oh, so I, got, I have to get rid of this C here also. So get rid of this C. Um, so let's uh, eliminate the solve for B. So, oh, I guess I already have this solved for D. So I'm just going to plug this in for here. And when I do that, I end up with um, I, K, uh, I guess I cannot get rid of this I anymore, right? Uh, I, have it, uh, I don't have I everywhere, so I cannot cancel it out. So it'll be uh, I k1 minus i k1 b is equal to minus um, k2, oh, sorry, kappa 2, See, I'm confusing myself, um, times 1 plus b.
All right, that seems like a simple enough algebra, but maybe not that simple. Okay, I'll move B over, move kappa over, then when you do that, this is what you end up with, um, I K1 plus kappa 2 is equal to, having moved the B over, I have plus I K1 B minus kappa 2 B. Everyone good? So when I solve for, when I factor out B, I get, um, so this is the thing inside, minus, uh, I K1 minus kappa 2. So when I solve for B, this is what I end up for, with uh, for B. B is equal to um, I K1 plus kappa 2 over I K1 minus kappa 2. I get a complex coefficient, and there's really no getting around that. Um, so, so um, yeah, well, there's no getting around the complex coefficient in this case. Yeah. And um, so, I guess I can give you this general rule. In quantum mechanics, as a rule, you have to deal with the complex functions. The only circumstance where you can avoid doing that are, oh, I raised it, are bound state, like infinite square well. When you have a bound state, then you can kind of choose to deal with the real functions. But any other, so this is not a bound state, right? You have a traveling incoming wave that gets reflected, gets decaying, it's not a bound state. And in that case, well, in general, you cannot avoid dealing with complex function. So, all right, so we have this value of B. Um, what does your intuition say um, the condition, what kind of condition should this B obey? You're from your, I don't know, classical intuition or your physical intuition. Like for this sort of situation where you have an incoming particle of energy less than the barrier, how many of these particles should reflect? All of it, right? So right now you might be a little bit confused looking at B and seeing that it's not equal to one, right? This is where it's important for you to remember that the so wave function itself, quote unquote amplitude, it doesn't mean anything. It has some phase factor in it and phase factor doesn't have any physical meaning other than you know, phase difference. So really you have to take the absolute value squared and it's important that you remember that this absolute value squared actually stands for this mathematical of operation. Complex conjugate times the wave function. So when I take the B absolute value squared, let's hope that, um, let's hope that we get uh, uh, one, because if it doesn't, then I made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> so let's try it out and see. So um, uh, let me do this calculation here. B absolute value squared is going to be complex conjugate of this, which is uh, minus I K1 plus kappa 2 divided by minus I K1 minus kappa 2. That's complex conjugate times um, the B itself. So I K1 plus kappa 2 divided by I K1 minus kappa 2. Um, oh, I see some cancellation. That's uh, hopeful. Um, if I so all this really is is minus times this, right? So this cancels out this, except you leave a minus sign behind. Let's hope it gets cancelled out somewhere else. Oh, I think these two are opposite of each other, meaning I can rewrite this as a minus this. Wait, wait, that, that's not right. Uh, 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 wait, let me rewrite it correctly. I can rewrite this as factoring out a minus. I can have a minus sign here, so minus here, and then plus here. Yeah? Then this cancels this out exactly, having left a minus sign. These two minus signs cancel, so I do end up with a one. 
it reflect, the reflectivity is equal to one here. It, uh, particles coming in have 100% chance of reflecting. Um, but so let me ask you this question. So the fact that particles coming in having 100% chance of reflecting, um, is there any probability, any chance for the particle to be found within this barrier region? Like, what would you say is the, is the probability of detecting particle? Would you say that this is equal to zero in this region here? So this is the curious quantum mechanical fact. The value of d, whenever you find it, it's not going to be zero. And this value of d will determine where it's starting from. And it's an exponential decay. It's not an immediate decay. It does decay with some particular characteristic length, which means the value of psi of x here, it's not zero which means when you take the psi absolute value squared, that's going to be bigger than zero, which means you have non-zero probability of detecting particle in this region. And um, I guess intuitively, this is how it connects to the quantum tunneling, which you are going to work through in a homework problem or something, um, is if this barrier was so narrow that if the barrier ended, before this wave function entirely decayed, that's where it would tunnel through and continue to go through. And if that's the case, that will modify the coefficients when you apply the boundary conditions, B will change ever so subtly so that it's no longer equal to one. So um, I'm not actually showing that. And here's the second thing that actually took me a long time to be reconciled with, that it's actually a physically true thing happening. Um, Suppose you, uh, de you, know, you de uh, ran your particle detector or whatever, and you actually found the particle to be located here. You actually found the particle here. And you know particle came in with some amount of energy E. How much energy do you think this particle would have here if uh, you found it at this X location? Do you think the particle here would have energy E or some different value? No, some different, it cannot have energy E because at a minimum, it needs to have the potential energy. So if you found the particle here, the moment you detected it, its energy was at least V naught. And it probably was moving too. Um, in that case, it might have an even greater energy than V naught. So what's happening here? I thought the particle only came in with the energy E. Like how, how did it end up with more than the energy it had at the beginning? So, you know, this is something that uh, when you feel like you understand this is when you are beginning to understand quantum mechanics. I'll just tell you my process, kind of describe the process I went through, and it'll take you some time to actually think of this through. It usually takes upper division quantum mechanics. So what I thought was then, does this mean energy conservation is violated? It absolutely does not mean that. I can tell you right now that nowhere in modern physics energy conservation is ever violated. In nowhere in quantum electrodynamics, nowhere in particle physics, energy conservation is ever violated. Uh, now you can write your equations in a way that looks like energy is violated. Those are bad ways of writing your equations. You write it in a Lorentz invariant way that says energy conservation is absolutely observed. Um, so, and so energy conservation is still observed. So how is it observed here? So for you to be detecting particle here, it must be interacting with something. In fact, that's how you are detecting the particle. If this is an electron, it could be you are shining light. And that light would consist of photons. For you to localize the particle at this location, 
the photon will have to be a particular wavelength, and that wavelength of photon will have enough energy to impart to the electron to actually you know, say that, all right, uh, to give en enough energy to it. To, once it's detected, it does have more than the potential energy, and probably quite a bit more because you're localizing the particle. But what, um, so all of this, like you didn't hear experimental description of that when I was working it out with these differential equations. Is that all these, uh, or some, all these things are built into our theory into our theory, theory we are building in, that whatever detection you do, it's going to interact with the system and disturb the system. And that's a kind of intuitive origin of the uncertainty principle. That when you try to localize the position, in the process of it, you're just going to impart some amount of momentum to increase the momentum uncertainty. And so here, you know, energy conservation is still fine. The moment you detect the particle here, whatever detector you're using have interacted with the particle, gave it enough energy so that it's OK to be here, because now it has more than the potential energy. So, say you could, so theoretically, like conceptually, just theoretically, like if you don't ever detect it, then the particle would never be there then? So that's a very good question that you will only get a satisfactory answer to in maybe upper division quantum mechanics. So you are asking me where was the particle before you detected it, right? I refuse to answer that question because <laughs> whatever answer I give is not going to be <laughs> correct. The, um, so this is the standard answer, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is the standard version taught in upper division, is that before you detected it, particle didn't have a position. <laughs> uh, it's an unsatisfactory answer, but that's uh, the main line, uh, mainstream interpretation that you are, I'm required to teach you. <laughs> so, all right, so that's uh, all the uh, um, solution with the step function. Um,